All right, good morning. Good morning. Let us uh, continue our discussion on the pre-colonial experience in the African novel by looking at 2000 seasons by Ayukurama. Remember that we need to read at least eight novels for the exams and you also need to read every novel that we taught. We try to make copies of available because reading is quite important to being able to grapple with the issues being taught. That's what you need to understand. So like the ancestor, like the ancestor, 2000 season is a post-colonial novel. But in spite of that, we can still glean from it the pre-colonial experience or the pre-colonial experiences of the African people. The novel was published in 1973, and the author is Ayukwe Ama. What the author attempts to do in the novel is to represent the colonial history of Africans as well as the resistance of Africans to that history. But the author is also conscious to tell us that African history did not begin with slavery or colonialism, but that before then we had a pre-colonial era when Africans lived uninterrupted by foreign powers. In 2000 seasons, AMA represents two types of colonialism. One is the Arab colonialism And these are the people who come from the desert. They are the predators from the desert. Arab colonialism had a religious background which is jihadist in nature. It is jihadist in nature. Which is to spread Islam and to punish unbelievers. So this is represented in the novel. And you could see when he's talking about Arab colonialism, he will definitely use Arabic names like Abdallah, 
And then he also talks about Western colonialism, another type of colonialism represented in 2000 seasons is Western colonialism. He calls them the white destroyers from the ocean. They come, these ones come from the ocean. He calls them the white destroyers from the ocean. And each of these two types of colonialism impacted the African society negatively. For instance, it divided society. The scene that it divides society, pitches citizens against one another, because they would definitely be able to buy the hearts of some of the citizens, and then they would divide the society against those who don't believe in the way or in the African culture. But our concern is not necessarily to look at colonialism, the colonial experience, but because this is a post-colonial novel, to see what can be retrieved from the postcolonial novel as constituting our pre-colonial experience. That is the way of life before the coming of the colonial masters. And we see this, we see the attempt by Ama to tell us that our history did not begin with slavery or colonialism, but that we had our pre-colonial societies right from the prologue of the novel. Right from the prologue of the novel. So in the prologue, Ama tells us that African people are not the people of yesterday. That we are the people of the way. In the novel, it's explicitly stated that we are not a people of yesterday, implying that African people are rooted in the earth. We were the first civilization. Africans were the first civilization, had the first civilization. We are the cradle of civilization. The first set of people in the world to be civilized. And that happened in Egypt, where we had black Egyptians. The original Egyptians were black people. So this is not just fiction, it's a fact. So in this novel, colonialism is seen as that which disrupts the cultural flow. Colonialism is a danger to the cultural flow, cultural harmony of the African people. So this is what Ama shows in the first chapter of the novel, which is entitled The Way. Please get the novel and read. So we see this in that first chapter, when Ama says, we are not a people of yesterday. This narrative, this discourse is necessary because of the debilitating consequences of the colonial rule facing the people at the moment. This novel 
This story is told at the height of the colonial encounter. And the idea is to counter the colonial master's ideology that we didn't have a culture. So this is why this novel perfectly fits into our discussion on how the pre-colonial experience in Africa should be retrieved from the post-colonial novel. Because we cannot go back to have to live in the pre-colonial time and we do not have novels then. Okay? So our authors are writing at a time when they needed to grapple with the consequences of colonialism. And it is the consequences of colonialism that makes it necessary for the people, for the writers, to remember their glorious, their glorious past. So, so memory as palimpsest, memory as palimpsest is seen in the novel when the author writes. Memory, memory as palimpsest in the last class, we try to explain what palimpsest is all about. A faint script underneath a current script, which is the positionality of the pre colonial discourse in post colonial novels. It's a faint script buried under the layers of post colonial narratives. So the narrator says, of the time still known as the time of men, our knowledge is fragile. The time is bound in secrets of what is revealed. All is in fragments. So that is an example of um, the pre-colonial experience existing, existing as a palimpsest in post-colonial novel. Of the time still known as the time of men, our knowledge is fragile. When we were still men, we cannot recollect it in full. It comes in fragments. It comes um, in ways that only our memory can favor. This remembrance is that, is that the recollection is at the mercy of the memory. How the memory allows you to remember is how you remember it. You cannot have the whole story. Because the human memory has its own frailties, its own weaknesses. So you might not be able to recollect the story in full, but it will come in fragments. And that is how we retrieve the palimpsest of pre colonial experience in a post colonial novel. So in this novel, there is an attempt to remember the past because of the current realities facing the people. There is need to write down the story of our past glory so that the colonial master's hegemonic narrative will not be the only narrative in the future. That is the essence of this novel. The novel is also a warning for the people not to follow the white road, which is a metaphor for Western culture, not to follow the white road, which is a metaphor for Western culture. But it's already seen that the majority of the people are following the new culture, are, are, are walking in the white road which is dangerous in the long run. So this novel has a motive of warning throughout, and most people do not heed the warning, and there are consequences in the novel.
In this chapter, we are told of the colonialist narratives about Africa. When the narrator says, the air everywhere around is poisoned with the truncated tales of our origins, meaning the lies the colonial masters told about Afri um, the origins of Africans, truncated tales, I mean falsehood, twisted stories that will not represent Africans, which is why it, there's need for Africans to actually record their stories and also to warn other Africans against other Africans against um, following the ways of the colonial masters. This warning comes in the form of prophecy by Anoa. Anoa is an oracle as well as a place in the novel. And now I prophesy the coming of the colonial masters. From the ocean, as the Western colonial masters, after the Arab colonial, uh, colonialism, in the following words, not so far, not so far off, ah, so near, already so near, Another race is talking, hungry, hungry for victims, thirstier than the desert it calls home. So now I prophesy 2,000 seasons of slavery. If the people do not heed its warning, At the moment, the African people are seen as those who have been hypnotized by the Western colonial uh, Western culture. The African people are seen as the people who have been hypnotized by Western colonial culture. So the whole of chapter one is full of warning about the colonial masters who are coming from afar to enslave the people. Chapter two is entitled Ostentatious Cripples. And in this chapter, we are told about the predators who came from the desert. They came as they came as beggars at first, and would soon turn against the host, who are the Africans. They will soon turn against the host who are the African. And then we'll go on to massacre them. These are the Arab predators. So what this story shows us that shows us that we've not we did not always have foreign elements and their culture in our land. There was a time when we lived free from them. It was at a point in our existence that they came. Chapter 3 is entitled The Predators. Thank <laughs> you. 
and it still talks about the Arab colonizers who spread the religion through violence to the jihadist means. In the story, they divide society by converting some and using them to fight against the others. This is the same situation that we find in Things Fall Apart. When the activities of the missionaries divide, divide the society, divide, divide the mafia. And you have characters like Enoch who fight the culture represented by them, by the masquerade and the python. In this novel, the pre-colonial African people had a culture of resolving issues through open argument, as can be seen in the case of the controversy surrounding the choice of Kumi as caretaker, which some people um, argue should be a duce because Kumi was not related by blood to Duemo and Pensa, the previous caretakers. So this is a metaphoric, this is a metaphoric way of talking about how disputes were resolved in pre-colonial African society, and also how succession to the throne was done. There, were, there was order in the succession of throne. It was through. It was through, it was a hereditary. You needed to have the bloodline running in you in order to become king. But here you have someone who does not have the bloodline, but because he has a connection with the colonial masters, he wants to impose himself on the people. So, as we have said, it is a post-colonial novel but from the events depicted, we can, we can have a, an idea about how our pre-colonial societies worked. So chapter 4 is entitled, The Destroyers. And in this chapter, we see the fulfillment of the word of prophecy from Nollyway. Who is the daughter of Anna's ancient Otrams? The fulfillment of the prophecy is seen in the arrival and destruction of the people's culture by Western culture. Mm -hmm. 
So in the midst of this destruction done to the society by, this, by the invading cultures, a set of people decided to come together to save society. These are the special people who believe in the African culture and tradition and want to save it, preserve it for the next generation. They even tried to lead society, the community, to a, a different place where the colonial masters will not reach so that they can continue to uh, live there as they used to before the colonial masters came. In, the, in chapter 4, we know that the colonial masters have ravished so many different places that are mentioned in the novel. And they are approaching Anoa. Just as in things fall apart, when the people of Mafia were hearing of the activities of the colonial masters in other places, like Mbaino, it's the same thing that happens here. They know the, the, the destructive stories that trailed the path of the colonial masters in other places like Simpa, Anago, Bome, and Away. Places where the colonial masters had reached and had destroyed. And again, in this story, we also see that most times the colonial masters would not have power to overcome the people except they have internal traitors among the people. And this will usually come in the form of um, leaders like Karanche. Greedy leaders like Karanche, who are ready to sell the people for any little gifts given them by the colonial masters. So Karanche is the one who welcomes the colonial masters and, and tells them of how they are going to have access to Anoa. So the, the traitor is always within. Without an insider, the defenses of a village, of a town, or a city, or a country will be difficult to surpass by invaders. So the colonial masters were not welcomed at Anoa. There was resistance, what we call colonial resistance. The people are seen to resist the colonial masters. This is seen in the arrows being shot at the white man's ship. The flaming arrows shot at the white man's ship in the novel. This forces the, the ship to retreat far away from Anoa. So in most cases, Africans did not just open their arms to welcome the colonial masters, as if we love their culture. We resisted, Africans resisted colonialism because not only did the oracle warn against the invasion, the people themselves knew how destructive the colonial masters were. 
So mostly colonialism succeeded in Africa because African people were conquered with some assistance from Africans, fellow Africans. So after this resistance, of course, the colonial masters had better weapons, so they shelled and are killing many people and destroying homes. They had guns, whereas we used arrows that had flames. We used guns, that had better weapons. So this destruction will weaken the people. This, this killing will weaken the people. So Africa was conquered. That shows that Africa was conquered, ruled by force, by the colonial masters. We will not just welcome them, come and rule us, surprise us. No, Africans were mostly conquered, subject, subjected to colonial rule, subjugated. And this is the truth. So after this subjugation, the colonial masters make a proposal to the people. And the person who interprets this proposal to the people is called Isanusi. But he is not a traitor. He is the people of the way. He is one of the people of the way. One of those who still believe in African culture and tradition. And he is going to lead a group of young initiates to resist the colonial masters. So that is why his interpretation is based on truth. Because you know the interpreters of that time used to lie a lot. Usually when they were bought over by the colonial masters, they would not tell the people the truth. They only tell the people what he wants the people to hear, what the white people want the people to hear. But it's also tells the people the truth, that the white people want to exploit their natural resources. Remember that the basic motive of colonialism was economic. It was to exploit African resources. It was not to civilize Africans. That was just what they told the old world. The exploitation of our natural resources, all the natural resources in the land. They also wanted to trade in human goods. They also want to trade in human goods. What do we mean by human goods? Slaves. Slaves, human beings seen as commodities. They also want to establish the Christian centers, Christian religious centers, churches. Just like the Arab colonizers established their mosques. So in the words of Osanusi, I quote, Hear now the last wish of the white men. They have a road they follow, and something called a god they worship. Not a living spirit there is in everything, but a creative separate raised above all surrounding things. To hear them speak of it, rather like a, a, a bloated king. Okay, the Africans, the Afri Africans do not believe that there is one God. Africans believe um, in the existence of different gods. So this is why th this religion is strange to the Africans. Because this particular God they are talking about makes himself look like a king that everybody has to obey. It is the white man's wish to take us from our way. 
in this novel, the way means the African way of life, which is the African culture. So if the white man wants to take us from our way, it means that the white men want to take us from our culture. So after this truthful interpretation, his anonsi is to be banished for telling the people the truth in disobedience to King Karanche. So the banishment will lead the initiates and his anonsi away from home where they will stay to plot against Karanche. And try to take back society from these imposters. So the, no the whole novel is filled with this struggle to take back society from the colonial masters and the consequences of not listening to the proper leadership of Isanusi, as well as the consequences of following the colonial master's way of life. But then we have to pay attention to th indices in the novel that point to the existence of pre-colonial African existence or culture. A good example is the spirit of communality the spirit of communality among the African people because Africans knew that their faith was connected. Everyone's faith was connected. So the African society is not basically individualistic but communal. We are all related. So we live like a community. One man's business concerns the other man. Not the white man's culture that says, mind your business. So the pre-colonial African spirit of com communality and collective survival is attested to in Abena's decision to go with others to the treacherous, treacherous um, feast organized by Karanche when she could have saved herself by staying away. In her words, I came because of us. There is no self to save apart from all of us. What would, have, what would I have done in my life alone like a beast of prey? So she has the opportunity to serve herself, but she decides to go with the, the rest. Because the, you know, the feast is organized in a ship and they are going to be betrayed. The king asks her if he is a repentant and invites them to come for a feast. But when they are there, they are going to be betrayed and captured as slaves. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Another indices of pre-colonial experience is seen in the use of work sum. The use of work sum in the novel. But in captivity, this work song is used as a communication strategy among the slaves. In captivity, in captivity, the work song is used as form of communication among the slaves. This communication is to help them escape from the slave ship. And it actually works because the slave ship is destroyed and the slaves free themselves, even though some of them die. So after freeing themselves from slavery, they try to live in a society that is free from colonial rule. In the novel, we have instances of how the people took care of themselves without discovered therapies indigenous therapies, meaning that we are our own medicine. For instance, we have the plant Ehuka. Ehuka, whose seed is used as soap, as soap, kind of healing soap. It washes the death from the body. So Africans had the traditional soap from plant seeds. So it wasn't as if we were uncivilized before the colonial masters came. We were not um, Africans did not wash themselves well. We also have the hunting tree, and the most important thing about this thing is that they are not chemical; they are natural, which is what everyone is going back to now: natural. Because chemicals, products, chemical products, products made with chemicals and good for the body. People have realized that, so they now go want to go natural, as natural as it is possible. So we have the hunting trees to help wash their clothes in the river. The hunting trees to help wash their clothes in the river. Then we have the Ayamdua tree. The Ayamdua tree. The Ayamdua tree. It provides medicinal relief for the sick. Traditional medicine has been known for a long time, but it has not been developed in modern time. So this novel attests to the fact that Africa had its own um, medical system, where ways of healing people, which was natural. So we have the Yamdua tree, which provides medicinal relief for the sick. 
You also have the Kahana, the Kahana tree. Kahana tree that can also be used to heal. Then we have the Tuapi. The Tuapi. Which prevents tooth decay. So, but in the wake of modern culture, all these things were discouraged because the colonial masters had to impose their products. It was economic. If the Africans continued to use their leaves, they would not buy the, the items that were shipped from Europe to Africa. And so they first of all had to condemn these African practices so that they would justify their own the use of their own product. And it is seen that over time, it has been realized that these Western products have done more harm than good because they do have side effects. Okay? Western medicines have side effects. It will treat one illness fine, but it will also cause another. All right? And when you treat that one, the medicine will, that you used to treat that one will cause another illness. And so you now go and buy another medicine, treat that illness. That one will go, but that medicine will cause another illness. All right? So at the end of the day, you are simply depending on drugs for survival. Okay? Because if you don't buy, if, you, if you, it cures you and then you are well forever, then you will, the, the industry will not grow. So it has to cure and cause another illness so that you keep buying medicine. Because this medicine is uh, made with chemicals that sometimes have side effects on the body. In fact, sometimes they warn you, that if you take this medicine, it might cause this, it might cause that. So there's something um, faulty about Western medicine. The African way was the best way because it was the natural way. Everything was done from the natural perspective. So what is seen in the novel is the attempt by the initiate to recreate African traditional values wherever they live. In studying the initiates, we see that they represent African pre-colonial cultural values. This is seen in chapter five, entitled The Dance of Love. The Dance of Love.
one thing that comes out of our study of the initiatives is that Africa had its own educational system. Africa had its own educational system, which was informal. We call it informal system of education. Where the, the male and the female children are trained on that the roles expected of them in society. They are trained on the role expected of them in society. And they are taught all aspects of life. Nothing is hidden from them. Education is best done when, in, when the person is young, from childhood. Education prepares the child for adulthood. To be able to take on responsibilities, take care of themselves and their family, because it's about assuming the roles expected. So one of these roles is the individual, that individuals should have something to do, a handwork, okay? So various skills are taught to the young ones at the point of initiation. Various skills are taught to the young ones at the point of initiation. That's why as you are in school now, this is the time for you to pick up all the skills that you can. Because you're preparing yourself for life after school. You take your education seriously. Because you're preparing yourself to take up roles after your education. So various skills are taught to the young ones at the point of initiation. These skills are practical skills to help them survive in the environment and society. So you have to look at society out there and ask what skills you will need to survive when you get out there. That's what education is all about. The education that does not equip you with the skills to survive in society is not practical. And remember that the colonial masters did not give us practical education. They did not give us technology. They did not give us science. They only gave us Bible education. But look at the informal education given to African children. It's practical. They include skills of protection, be to be a soldier, skills of protection, farming skills, hunting skills, fishing and rowing, building, carving, leather work, metal work, molding, weaving, healing. That's medicine. The skills include protection, as maybe to be a soldier, to be a warrior, farming skills, hunting skills. And each of these skills is practical. Because they would, if you are hunting, they will take you to the bush. If you are farming, they take you to the farm. If you want to be a farmer, they take you to the farm. If you are going to be a warrior, they take you to live in the camp where warriors stay. It's practical. Fishing and rowing. Molding. Weaving. Healing. That's healing arts. That's medicine. We are told in the novel that each of these areas has a basic level and an advanced level. Each of these areas has a basic level and an advanced level. The advanced level is where you become experts. 
Like it's like going for masters after your, after your first degree. That means you deepen your knowledge in the area you have chosen. So you are not just a farmer, but you're an expert in farming. You can teach others. So you have to deepen your knowledge. It is a form of specialization. So this is a postcolonial novel, but see what we have retrieved from it. We have retrieved our life in pre-colonial societies from this postcolonial novel. And what we have retrieved is a palimpsest in the pre-colonial novel, or in the post-colonial novel. All right? So these experts are called fundi, they are teachers. Fundi. So through training and experimentation, each young person will identify what he or she is very good at and what they love to do. Some will love farming, some will love hunting, some will love fishing. And so they choose their profession. In the novel, we are told that in the end, about 20 initi initiates could not be drawn to any of the skills. And they are called the special ones. They are going to be leaders. They are called the special ones. I cannot be drawn to any of the skills we've mentioned, 20 of them. And we say that the special ones that are going to be leaders of society. These special initiates are subjected to further traditional education to prepare them for their leadership role as philosophers and historians of society. These special initiates are subjected to further traditional education to prepare them for their leadership role as philosophers and historians of society. As philosophers and historians of society. Remember, Aristotle has said that only philosophers should be leaders or the leader should become a philosopher. So it's the same idea that is sustained in this work. Then began that initiation of which the fundis had spoken. The whole dedication had not yet been drawn to any of the particular arts. We were left to float for the knowledge of a craftsmanship of the soul. The vocation of these of those who used to be the soul guide of our people, leaders, the remembrance of the way, historians. So there are twenty in number, eleven girls and nine boys. There are twenty in number, eleven girls and nine boys. One of these young initiates is by name Bentum. One of these young initiates is by name Bentum. He is King Carantia's son. He is King Carantia's son. Carantia's son. He was educated ab ab abroad. He had Western education. Of course, his father was drawn to the Westerners. Because of this, it, it, his name was changed from uh, from um, his name was changed to Bradford Judge. Bradford Judge. Bradford 
judge. Right? He married a white woman. No man is 20 years older than him. So this initiation will end in the dance of love, the dance for adulthood, the dance to choose partners. Ten special girls would dance to choose nine boys collectively. And we are told in the novel that initiation is synonymous with education. Initiation means education in the novel. To go through the rites of initiation means to be educated in the traditional African setting. So it's expected that Abena, the most beautiful girl, would choose Bentum because she is son of the king. After all, the father has been trying to woo her for the son. But she refuses. Instead, she joins the group of 20. At the end of the day, the lovers leave for the forest to consummate their love. So they are now adults and could now have partners. So it's at this point that Isanusi tells the young initiate, you have grown up, seen white men among us. Of their coming, you have been taught none of the deeper truths. So they have more to learn about their way of life. So Isanusi is going to educate them about the history of the people, their culture, and what happened in the past. Because all leaders must know the history of their communities. It, it teaches them about the nature of leadership in pre-colonial societies. He urges them not to forget their, their culture, which is the African culture. The final chapter of the novel is entitled The Return. The Return in Chapter 6. In this sixth chapter of the novel, the author presents the different views to the colonial predicament. What should we do as a people being faced with the colonial culture? What should we do as a people being faced with the colonial culture? There are three divergent views. One, one view says that we should accept the new way of life. Another says that we should return to the pre-colonial past. Then the third voice says 
that we should go with the way. The third voice is the call to the way. Let me tell that again. The, the first view is that we should accept the new culture. The second view is that we should return to our pre-colonial culture. And the third view says we should embrace the way. And what is the way? In the words of the novelist, it is the call to reciprocity. Reciprocity, give and take. Give and take. It is the call to reciprocity in a world wide clean of destroyers, innocent again of predators. This is a form of identity that acknowledges Africa's past coloniality. Africa's post-coloniality. This is a realistic perspective because a purist return to pre-colonial past is impossible under the present circumstances. That is, the idea that it is difficult for us to return to our pre-colonial past because our culture has already been destroyed by the colonial masters and are already with us. To what society clean of predators means to have independence, send them back to Europe, which was as, what has happened. But our, their culture still live with us. But if we have to go by the way, which is reciprocity, then we have to imbibe our culture, take from our culture what is rich and beautiful, and also combine it with other people's culture that we cannot ignore. That is how all cultures in the world have developed, including the English culture. So please take note of that. And this is the question that this novel answers concerning, because when we talk about having lost uh, pre-colonial culture, people want to know what is to be done. And the author believes that taking the colonial master's culture wholesale, everything that they tell us is destructive. And returning to our pre-colonial culture is difficult because times have changed. So what the individual has to note is that he or she is living in changing times, but that should not make him forget his culture. Don't make her forget, forget her culture. The African person has to remember his culture, practice his culture within the bounds of reason. And should also take aspects of the foreign culture that are, that, that are healthy and practicable combine it with his own and move forward. That is the idea. And that is how we end our discussion on the pre-colonial experience in the African novel.